Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Glenn Greenwald recently joined me on my own podcast, Bad Faith, on an episode that aired yesterday. And he has said some pretty stunning um, insights, had some pretty stunning insights about the Twitter files and the criticisms that have been coming down about how the Twitter files were actually administered. I asked him, are those kinds of criticisms something that would prevent him from being willing to be an administer of one of these Twitter files drops? This is what he had to say. I probably would not have felt totally comfortable, to be honest, with the way in which it was done, in the sense so. that they were the they were the guardians of the information, and the only information that you end up getting is information they decide to give you. And I'm not willing to kind of be manipulated by the possibility that people are handpicking what they want me to see or don't want me to see, because that can end up causing me or putting me in the position where I'm unwittingly serving as a spokesperson for an agenda that is not mine. Glenn, so, isn't that kind of a big deal? Isn't that kind of a significant critique? And and I think probably one of the only good faith critiques that's come down about everybody, including people whose journalism I respect so much, like Matt Taibbi, is that if you aren't able to have direct access to the primary documents, if you are, to your point, being served up some kind of sliver. I mean, I, I've seen that asked in like a call-in situation. What about censorship of the left? And he said, well, I just haven't seen very much of that. And maybe that's true. Maybe Twitter just had not that much interest in, in censoring the left. Fine. But when you are only getting a piece of the pie, it puts someone who is a good faith actor like Matt Taibbi in the position of making a representation like Twitter wasn't that focused on censoring the left, that he might not be able to realistically speak too truthfully because he only has a, a piece of the picture. Right. All he can say is, I didn't see it. And the reason he maybe didn't see it is because he wasn't shown it. So I guess, like, you know, again, um, first of all, let me just say that there were no real left-wing journalists brought in, although, like, a framework that doesn't count Matt Taibbi and Lee Fong as leftist is one that I don't fully trust. But, like... It is true that people who are, say, like, real leftists were not brought in. But notice as well that there were no real, like, MAGA journalists or far-right sure. journalists. They didn't invite Breitbart in or, you know, uh, Charlie Kirk in. I mean, he. I think Elon's vision of politics is a little bit simplistic. He, he thinks he's supposed to avoid the far left and the far right. And the people in the middle are the ones you trust. And to him, the middle is Barry Weiss, Matt Taibbi, Michael Schellenberger, these kind of people— and I think that was sort of what guided him. The critique that you're making that you only get what journalists, what the source shows you, and therefore they, the source may end up being able to manipulate your journalism is completely correct. All I'm saying, once again, though, is that this is always how it is. Now, for context, Glenn goes on to say in the interview that this is the situation that many journalists have found themselves in. There was some healthy pushback from my audience about those points. But he also took to in the uh, Internet that day, yesterday, to say, to put this in full context, one, all journalism is based on what sources provide, except if you have full access to government or corporate files. This is always the case. Two, what Taibbi et al. reported was highly newsworthy on its own. Three, Fong today said he had full access and no limits. When Daniel Ellsberg gave the Pentagon Pentagon Papers to the New York Times. How did they know that he didn't admit things? They didn't, but they knew that what he provided standing alone was newsworthy. Same with Snowden. The Brazil Archive, WikiLeaks, or when New York Times CNN report uh, on what the CIA tells them to say. Um, he says, for his own show system update on Rumble, we interviewed four, maybe five journalists who reported the Twitter files. They all said the same. Nobody from Twitter paid them. There were no restrictions on what they could say or report. Nothing com compromised their editorial independence. And yet, Glenn also said that he would feel some reservation about being one of the journalists responsible for a Twitter files drop because of that selective um, nature of getting the documents at hand. So what do you make of this? Are you surprised that uh, here Glenn seems to be echoing some of, I think, the best faith criticism that's come down about this from the left, at least? Um, well, no, I'm not surprised to hear Glenn saying that because I, I think he is a pretty good and pretty fair uh, journalist. I don't Always agree with him, um, but uh, I think he's. I think he's also very good on the process of journalism, talking about how journalism should work. Yeah. Um, and and like him, I feel that yeah. While it might be, and I, I agree with what he's saying that all journalism, it's the project of journalism, is a project of curating information for an audience. 
and it's who do you trust to do the curating. I mean, this is an issue we have with the mainstream media, sometimes even with the New York Times and the Washington Post, what they choose to include or not include in things that they write about, and then how they package it and how they headline it and how they image it. These are all editing decisions and curating decisions that sometimes are not good. You know, sometimes they, they bear, and with COVID, sometimes they've buried facts that I think are relevant. Sometimes they're bringing in facts I don't think are relevant. Um, and then sometimes they're looking at, you know, they're looking at tons of information and they're deciding which aspects of that they think are rel uh, relevant for you and relevant for the article. That's something I've done as a, as a writer for a magazine and writing other places. You know, sometimes I'm looking at, uh, sometimes I'm summarizing lawsuits. I'm, I've been summarizing court documents. And maybe the court document is publicly available, and mm -hmm. I, so I, I'll post a link to it. But in my article, I'm saying, well, here's the argument they made, here's sure. the argument they made, and I'm choosing what I think is most interesting and was it, uh, uh, what is it relevant. But a different journalist might have looked at that exact same yeah, information and, and chosen different but things. But, Robbie, isn't there a difference between, say, um, Edward Snowden or Chelsea, Chelsea Manning in their capacity, given you know, with the access that they have, looking through files and leaking what they think the public should know about the government's misdeeds across the, mm -hmm. the globe. And let's say the NSA itself deciding what documents it wants the public to know about. And when we have more skepticism <laughs> about the nature of what story the NSA is trying to tell, I mean, we know the story that also Chelsea Man Manning is trying to tell, mm -hmm. but it is, isn't there something about the nature of it being a leak, a whistleblower report that's different than an organization kind of opening its doors the way that Elon Musk is the CEO mm -hmm. of Twitter, is the institutional actor here who is opening the kabuki, sure, but he's still as he's, he said himself, exposed to certain liabilities that are, of course, going to affect what disclosures are ultimately made. And should we be more skeptical about the nature of the story that's being told? You know, is, is Glenn right that he could be an unwitting participant in a kind of narrative that is not entirely accurate? And that even very good journalists whose work I respect and who are reporting on things that I think are very noteworthy, like Lee Fong, like Matt Taibbi, might be unwittingly in the same situation. Are you saying, is that conceivable? Could that be happening? Yeah. And, yes. And, and should there be a, a kind of a reluctance to participate in that unless there is more transparency? I mean, everybody, I guess, has to make that decision for themselves. I, I, I would not make that decision. It, it depends. Um, I mean, also, the, the, the process here, like we're talking about emails, tons of them, mm -hmm. tons of them, that they it doesn't seem... Like you can do a search for, I think, specific keywords to find what you're looking for, mm -hmm. or maybe certain email addresses. Uh, but there, there's so many. It's not. It's not quite the case that there's like just like a box of documents. Well, why don't they just publish all? Of it? It's so many. Well, well, no. But for example, you could disclose everything. Like what that Lee was is doing in my radar, for for example, yeah. or what what he said he's doing is he's asking, can you look for X thing? And then they're giving right. him all the documents they find that are responsive to X thing. It, Sounds like it's it's working like the FOIA process, although well, not, Twitter doesn't have the obligation the well, same way. Although the government tries to get on FOIA, I, I, all the I time would argue too. that I, even even respecting certain liability constraints from Twitter, things that could happen is publishing the search terms, publishing the number of hits that were responsive to the search terms, uh, publishing you know the the gap and number between the number of responsive hits and what was actually disclosed to Lee, having some kind of um, discovery record that explains why it was that certain documents were withheld, mm -hmm. giving a reason. I mean, this is how you have to do it in civil litigation. You have to give a reason for why you haven't turned over certain documents. And there are, there are protected classes of documents that you don't have to disclose. And obviously, Elon Musk can just say, I don't want to disclose it, and that's fine. But at least that would give us a better sense of how much transparency there really is right now. And look, I, I'm not saying that I necessarily even agree wholly with Glenn here. I, someone asked me after I posted this clip yesterday whether or not I would facilitate one of these Twitter file drops, report on a Twitter file mm -hmm. drop, if, if Elon Musk reached out to me and asked me. And I think at the end of the day, I probably would, in part because I would have access to some of the questions that I'm asking right now about how much transparency there really is. I would be able to design my search terms. I believe I would be able to report on my search terms. So I would say yes, contingent on whether or not I was in fact allowed to do all of those things. If I felt like unnecessary constraints were being put on me that put me in the position of only telling part of the story as I even saw it as a Twitter files journalist, then that would be a very different different situation. Yeah. I, I guess I don't have a lot of problem with what I've seen so far, and it's brought 
to light a lot of very interesting information, sure. a lot of information we didn't have. Um, the pressure campaign on uh, Twitter is a lot more vast um, than I would have even imagined. And uh, I, I think probably my number one quibble with it is just the format. <laughs> uh, <laughs> articles would have been better rather than having them rolled out on Twitter itself. Yeah. I guess I understand why I, I Elon made that. I think it's part of why I love Lee's uh, reporting and like, got into Lee's the reporting more. Article. Yeah, yeah. Um, would, that's been a little bit, and, and we've not known when they're going to be published, and if they said this is going to be part of a, a seven-week series and each one is coming, I mean, that yeah, would be more convenient the fatigue that's than happening. Friday or <laughs> late at night when I yeah. want to be checked out, but yeah. that's pretty, that's not really a criticism of the journalism sure. being done. That's, uh, absolutely. That's something else. Yeah. So, well, uh, you can listen to that full interview if you'd like over at uh, Bad Faith YouTube, and we'll have more rising for you right after this.